We can further classify the four different areas of clinical research that we defined in the previous lecture into two distinct types of research. In general, clinical research questions can be considered to be either descriptive or causal in nature. Simply put, in descriptive research, the main aim is to describe a relationship between some determinants and a clinical outcome, whereas in causal research, the main aim is to find out whether the clinical outcome is directly caused by the determinant you're interested in. This distinction will be important when considering what you plan to achieve with your research, as well as how you'll need to go about conducting your research. So how does this relate to our depth model? In general, for diagnostic and prognostic research problems, we're interested in seeing which information can help us predict a patient's diagnosis or prognosis. In effect, our aim is to describe the outcome in relation to some patient or test characteristics, known technically as determinants or predictors. In diagnostic research, we're interested in predicting the presence of disease, and therefore we want our research to describe how patient information and tests can help determine whether a patient currently has a specific disease. In prognostic research, we try to predict the future. We want our research to describe how patient characteristics can help to predict the cause of their disease. In descriptive research, any factor that's related to the outcome may hold valuable predictive information. And we might be interested in utilizing that information directly to enhance our predictions. We'll go into more detail about this in weeks two and three of the course. When you're interested in the etiology of a disease, you're by definition interested in what the cause of the disease is. The same goes for therapeutic or intervention research questions, where you're interested in whether the therapy of interest causes patients to get better, or possibly even get worse. In that type of research, it's not enough to just describe the association between an etiologic factor or a treatment and a health outcome. Evidence that the specific determinant of interest is directly causally related to the outcome needs to be established. This implies that in such causal research, it should be unequivocally shown that the observed relationship between that determinant and the outcome is not explained by another factor, that is, by confounding. Confounding bias is an essential consideration in causal research. Consider the following example. We are interested in studying the effects of smoking on the risk of Parkinson's disease. In order to establish whether or not smoking indeed causes Parkinson's disease, we need to make sure there are no differences between smokers and non-smokers regarding other risk factors for Parkinson's disease, such as age or alcohol consumption, or that these differences are accounted for. Also in intervention research, getting rid of such confounding is crucial. This will be discussed during week four of this course. In descriptive, that is diagnostic and prognostic research, causality, and thus confounding, is a non-issue. All determinants can be used to predict the diagnostic or prognostic outcome. Now that we have carefully categorized the nature of both our clinical problem and the research we would like to conduct, we can further develop our research question into one that is truly watertight. We can do this by specifying our research in terms of a relationship between the occurrence of an outcome and one or more determinants within a clinically relevant population, who we'll refer to as the domain of our research. The definition of the occurrence of an outcome as a function of one or more determinants or the occurrence relation is referred to as the theoretical design of a study. And it's the first step in designing a clinical epidemiological study. Let me clarify this using our COPD example. 
we have a tentative diagnostic research question along the lines of how can we use patient information and test results to determine whether or not a COPD patient with shortness of breath also has heart failure? To make our aims clearer, we can further define our research by three terms. First, we have the outcome. In this case, heart failure or the probability of patients having heart failure. In our research, we'll need to gather information about any confirmed diagnosis of heart failure in the patients enrolled in our study. Next, we have the determinants. In diagnostic research, there's typically more than one determinant. We want to know all of the relevant diagnostic tests that we could perform on our COPD patient to help determine whether they have heart failure. This also includes the patient history because knowing the patient's age, gender, and medical history is almost certainly going to improve our ability to reach the correct diagnosis. Remember that because this research question is a diagnostic question, we're interested in a descriptive relationship between the diagnostic determinants and the outcome. Thus, causality does not play a role, and in turn, we don't need to worry about confounding in our study. And finally, after the outcome and the determinants, we have the research domain. That is the group of people to whom we may want to apply our research findings. Careful consideration of the domain is vitally important as we need to make sure that our study collects information that's relevant to future patients. Do our research findings need to be applicable to any future patient who enters the clinic? Not quite. Remember our initial patient, the 70-year-old man who came into the clinic. He was suspected of having heart failure, but we needed clearer guidance to determine whether or not his symptoms were instead signs of worsening COPD. Our clinical problem isn't relevant to just anyone, so instead we must focus on people with an established diagnosis of COPD that present with symptoms suggestive of heart failure. This is the domain of our study. By including these additional terms to our research question, we complete the theoretical design of our study. This enables us to truly cater the next two steps in designing a clinical epidemiological study to our needs, the design of the collection of data and the design of the analysis of the data.